that is if you were to give us in prayer. We're going to come and summon the Holy Spirit to be given you. Dear Lord, we ask you to receive and send your Holy Spirit upon us to help us, to guide us, to give us the spirit of wisdom and understanding, bright judgment, courage, knowledge, and reverence. Fill us with the spirit of wonder and awe in your presence. We ask all of this in Christ our Lord. Amen. Before you, you have not only a note, uh, paper, and pen, but also um, a little card there that you could fill out if you would like to receive a link to the lecture itself. So we're going to record it tonight. And uh, if you would like that, please fill it out and just leave it here for us to pick up and to supply you with the link. So tonight, we introduce Dr. Peter Donson. Dr. Donson holds a PhD in geology and geophysics from Yale University. He also holds a, a BSc in geology from the University of Ottawa and an MSc from the University of Alberta. He's a professor of veterinary gross anatomy at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as dinosaur paleontology in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science. He's done field work in the Western United States and in Alberta. Since 1995, he's visited India and has participated in field projects in Madagascar, Egypt, Argentina, and China. With his students, he has made six genera of dinosaurs, two from the United States, three from China, and one from Egypt. He was the founding president of the Philadelphia Center for Religion and Science, and served as successor the Metanaxis Institute for Religion and Science until 2011. He's on the advisory board of the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College. In 2014, he was named Senior Fellow of the Collegium Institute for Catholic Thought and Culture. And in 2015, was named Resident Senior Fellow of the Program for Research on Religion and Urban Civil Society at the Fox Leadership Center at the University of Pennsylvania. He's been married for 50 years to his wife, Don, who's with us, and is blessed with two children and three grandchildren. He's currently a parishioner of the Catholic Community of the Holy Spirit in Woodstown, New Jersey, where he serves as lector, member of the parish council, and member of the social justice community. So today, we get to hear a wonderful lecture on fossils and faith. Let us please warmly welcome Dr. Dunn. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you, all of you who have come here this evening. There are many demands on our on our time. There are basketball games to watch, and baseball season to open today, and so on and so forth. So I'm very flattered that you choose to be here this evening, and I'm I'm very very excited to come here, and very grateful for the invitation uh, to speak to you. On a subject of tremendous interest to me, uh, perhaps we can might turn down the front row of all to that possible, um, Mr. H. I guess to hopefully enhance the visibility of your screen. Of course, the lights have to be on for you because I want nobody falling asleep here. <laughs> you must be attentive, uh, of course. So, uh, I'm a geologist uh, by training, I'm a paleontologist. I, I um, literally study dinosaurs, I'm a veterinary anatomist. An evolutionary biologist, uh, but I'm also a deeply committed Catholic Christian. There are some people that feel that this is inherently a contradiction. Oh, doesn't science uh, negate the claims of religion? No. <laughs> Short answer, no. Let me unpack that a little bit. So the three poles of my, my lengthy career in, in academia are my, my family, my faith, and my fossils. These are, the, these are these, these make me who I am, who I am. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk at least en passant on, on all three of these, but uh, let's start off with the fossils. So I've had the privilege of going around the world, as you've heard, and written some books on dinosaurs, and, and uh, those arrows show all the, the great places that I've been to in my, in my travels, and what, what a privilege it's been. I've, I've had a fabled career, I really have. Uh, where, where do you go to find dinosaurs? Well, these uh, six countries account for uh, about three quarters of all the dinosaurs in the world. Uh, China is today number one, 
Uh, the United States is number two. Uh, Argentina is number three. Uh, so these these uh, three countries uh, are just uh, fossil records. Uh, new fossils uh, are found all the time. They're constantly being described. Uh, and uh, Mongolia, England, and Canada uh, a little farther down the list, but still very vigorous uh, programs in paleontology. So these are the top countries. So isn't it great, isn't it great to be an American? You know, and, uh, we have so many dinosaurs. Uh, here's a map of what North America looked like uh, 75 million years ago. Uh, Florida would be down here. Well, Florida was completely underwater 75 million years ago. It, it will be uh, soon enough again, but Florida right, right there. Uh, so my recommendation is don't buy real estate in Florida. <laughs> uh, we see that uh, a great sea wave cut the North American continent in half. Uh, extending all the way from the Gulf of Mexico to uh, Alaska. And uh, for instance, we find the fossils of marine reptiles in Kansas. Kansas of all places. Uh, these dots show localities in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the United States and Canada where dinosaurs have been found. And all the way up to the north coast of Alaska. And these areas which today are thousands of feet above sea level uh, were in dinosaur time uh, very uh, very close to sea level. Uh, I would say that most dinosaurs and fossils are found uh, in North America within about 100 miles of the coastline. Mm -hmm. um, we, we had dinosaurs in the east, uh, uh, but the fossils are the conditions for finding that fossils in the east are not as good. Here's a, a little detail of that map. Uh, Philadelphia would be about there, so much of New Jersey was underwater during the dinosaur time. But we do find scattered remains along the Atlantic coast in the south. Um, but the, the top localities, of course, are in the west. This is a hero of mine, Professor Joseph uh, Leidy. Uh, he was the, uh, the father of American paleontology. He, he was a professor at my university, the University of Pennsylvania. And he described the first dinosaur fossils. Uh, and this was his great discovery. Uh, the dinosaur, the skeleton of Hadrosaurus fulci, the first dinosaur skeleton uh, known to science. Not the first uh, scattered dinosaur remains were found in England in the 1820s. Uh, but and, and also there, he described the first American dinosaurs in 1856. But it was a handful of teeth that came from what is today Montana. But in 1858, he found a partial skeleton. And at the time he found this, it was the most complete dinosaur skeleton known in the world. And it, it came from Haddonfield, New Jersey, only about 10 miles from Philadelphia. It's amazing. And this was the, not, this, it, this skeleton was not this complete. He, he found uh, pelvis and hind, uh, hind legs. He found four legs. He found some tail vertebrae, we found only a little fragment of the jaw. Uh, this was 1858. Um, but they reconstructed the, the missing parts uh, and uh, exhibited at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia in 1868. And this was the first time anywhere in the world that the dinosaur skeleton had been exhibited in the, in the, in the dinosaur mania was born in the United States. Very, very exciting. Uh, this is, we go forward 100 years or so, uh, this, this was a dinosaur skeleton uh, that I happened to find in Alberta in 1982. That was, it was a common, uh, it was a common member of the Duckville Dinosaur Service. Um, I found, uh, I, I was working in the Alberta Badlands and I found uh, the bottoms of four vertebrae sticking out of the ground and I found this upper arm bone nearby. And those are the telltale signs of a skeleton. And uh, I was not able to participate in the excavation of the skeleton. Uh, as a matter of fact, I wasn't even informed of it until the, until the following year. I came back to Alberta a year later and they said, Oh, Peter, do you want to see your skeleton? I said, What? <laughs> I, had to, I had to think. <coughs> uh, it turned out because you never know when you start thinking what you're going to find, whether. Uh, uh, 
part of the uh, tab tabulizing remains are very common. You find a bit of uh, little, uh, a little bit, but then it's like a, 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 you go walking through the woods and you see a deer skeleton. The deer has died, it's been pulled apart by, by dogs or coyotes and uh, foxes and uh, whatnot, and the bones are all scattered. Well, the same thing with fossil record. Uh, but in, on this happy occasion, uh, this turned out to be a complete skeleton. Now, then, including the skull, uh, this skeleton was uh, it was uh, the, this kind of dinosaur is already well known. It was uh, uh, it was named in 1923, uh, and um, uh, for a common dinosaur, buffalo dinosaurs are common in Alberta. Uh, this is a well known animal. So, under most circumstances, it would have gone into uh, storage in the basement of some museum. But as, as luck would have it, uh, the Terrell Museum of Paleontology was being built in Alberta, and they were looking for exhibition quality specimens, and this fit the bill. So if you visit uh, the Royal Terrell Museum in Drumheller today, you'll see that skeleton. And there's only the, in my entire career, I've only found two substantially complete skeletons. Uh, and I told them, uh, this is the first dinosaur that I that I described. This is a little horn dinosaur, which I named uh, Aegoceratops in uh, 1986. It came from the Carlos Creek Ranch in uh, South Central Montana, uh, and it turned out to be a small horn dinosaur, Aegoceratops. Uh, it turned out to be new, which is very exciting. So this is my first dinosaurian child, uh, and uh, I named it after. A, after another woman it was named after a, 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 a woman named Ava, my wife's name is Dawn, not Ava. Uh, so it uh, turns out this was a bit of a marital faux pas. <laughs> <laughs> I have addressed the issue. <laughs> uh, Ava was the wife of the man who first found the uh, elephant in the ground. And, and the, man, the, the skeleton was found on the uh, ranch belonging to the Paris Creek Ranch belonging to Lambert's house, so I used to the Lambert's. So there are reasons why I named it the way I did, but nonetheless, <laughs> I paid a price for it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that skeleton was at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. It was there, that's my dinosaur. I worked in Madagascar, this is the jaw of the EDD dinosaur I found. Uh, there, there's, 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 there it is in the ground, and there it is all cleaned up and looking beautiful, and the other parts look like that. So my jaw fits my, uh, right there, and it's a beautiful, magnificent uh, specimen of a medium dinosaur from Madagascar. It's a very exciting discovery. I had the privilege of going to Egypt with my students, and we found a very interesting dinosaur, a, 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 a partial skeleton, very, very partial. Uh, but very interesting dinosaur. Uh, this is this is the uh, uh, excavated bone. Only uh, uh, only a little bit of it was sticking out of the ground, so we started digging, and it turned out turned out to be a tremendously large arm bone. Uh, there, there it is, plastered up and ready to go to the uh, uh, museum. There it is, uh, uh, being hauled all along the cart. And there's the bone. This is a, a single bone of this dinosaur. And uh, it's the upper arm bone. And it measures five feet, seven inches high. And uh, it's from a long neck planting new dinosaur. Uh, the, at the time we just, uh, described this animal, uh, this was the second largest dinosaur human uh, ever described. Um, it's not, now it's in third place, I think, uh, to date. But uh, so it, was, it was a pretty spectacular discovery. Uh, we named this animal Paralophytes romeri. Paralophytes means uh, the, the giant from the swamps. Uh, as a matter of fact, Professor Stromer's the giant from the, uh, the swamps. Uh, Stromer was a German paleontologist who first worked in these beds in Egypt before the First World War. So that was a very exciting find. I worked in Montana with my students, uh, and 
we, we dug for half an hour and stayed in the spot. We dug for half an hour and leave the bones we pulled up in the, the first 30 minutes. Of it. That, was, that was exciting. And uh, these, are, these are the parts of the dinosaur that we found. Uh, neck, uh, forelimb, uh, some of the bones of the hind limb, uh, uh, some of the skull bone. We actually found the jaw, the partial brain case, and feet. Uh, it was uh, analyzed and incomplete. This is one of the vertebrae. This is a partial vertebrae from that specimen. So I invite you to come up and look at this. This dinosaur is about uh, 150 million years old. Very, very solid door stopper. And, <laughs> and, uh, that vertebrae was probably be somewhere in the middle of the tail. It's only half, half the vertebrae. Um, so uh, it, it is annoyingly incomplete, but yet there are enough critical parts here that allow us to identify it as a new kind of dinosaur. We name it Sulawasia Emilie, uh, which is an unusual name. Um, the name was constructed from the Pro Indian, the ancient thunder in, in Pro. Uh, my student came up with Spirit Harris. Uh, and I thought he did a very clever job of composing this name. And um, it means an ancient mother, so it's a reference to the dinosaur Brontosaur, one of the earliest described dinosaurs in the American West. Then I went to China. I had the, uh, I attended the meeting in Beijing in 1995. I'm very impressed with uh, a young Chinese uh, young woman. And I invited him to come to my university and study with me. And he did. And um, the first thing he did when he completed his PhD and went back was he named the dinosaur after me. That's pretty cool. So I'm Chinese, that dinosaur named after me. And it's named Magni Boston Thompsonite, which means Thompson knows. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Uh, but uh, uh, very importantly, he invited me to uh, come to China and work with him and bring students with me. So I worked in, uh, in China for a good number of years and, uh, and very successfully. And the first specimen we saw, uh, that I saw uh, was one that was collected by his colleague, uh, Li Daqing, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, and then just a couple of years previously. Uh, and I looked at this specimen and immediately I saw it was something new. Uh, and uh, th this, this is it. Uh, this is a, uh, a study cast of it, so it's not the actual specimen. But this, this is the size of it. Uh, it's very, very well preserved. Uh, but my first reaction is, oh, it's terribly <laughs> ugly. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's quite old. But then, then my next reaction is, oh, Let's name it after Dawn. Let's let me name it after my wife. <laughs> so this is it. Uh, and, uh, so we talked to it at the Dawn, so in Latin, Aurora. Aurora Serenops. Uh, so this was Dawn's dinosaur. So I I uh, I made good on, on the, the, this faux pas that I committed to, to 19 years earlier. <laughs> but now she has a dinosaur named after her as well. Of course, she's not at all ugly. This is Dawn and, 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 my, uh, and our daughter. There, there's our granddaughter. So I said I'd get some family in there. So that is sort of a family affair. And it's Julia. That's, that's my first grandson, Jonah. So, yes, that is sort of family that go naturally together. <laughs> so what does Aurora Serenops look like? It looks like something like this. It's an artist's reconstruction of it. This is another uh, dinosaur that we named, a, a Chinese uh, long neck, uh, and again, very partial remains, but very distinctive remains. And uh, we were able to determine that it, it's a uh, new dinosaur, and uh, the name is somewhat daunting, uh, Yong Jing Long. Uh, uh, the Chinese name for uh, dinosaur is Kong Long, means terrible lizard. So we see the suffix on the dinosaur name the suffix of long, then you know that it's a Chinese dinosaur. Uh, and Yongjing is actually the county from which it comes. So Yongjing long means the, the, the 
dragon from uh, Yongjin County. <laughs> and this is just uh, working in the Gobi Desert, finding the leaves of fossils in the ground and so on and so forth. And that, that's, that's, that's Dr. Yu, my student, uh, and that's uh, our colleague, Da Ching. Uh, one of the great things about working in China is the, the, the culture of respect for our elders. And the fact that I that I am the doctor father of, of Dr. Yu, who's a respected research, Chinese researcher, means they always treat me tremendously well. It's very, very nice to meet you. And that's a, a Chinese student of mine. Uh, and uh, the, she, she's put together this montage of our activities in the laboratory, in the veterinary laboratory. Okay, so now the, the, the God part of my talk. Um, I wrote an essay in, I, there, was, there was a uh, newsletter, it's no longer published, it's called American Family Health. Uh, it was published uh, in Ithaca uh, by the Family uh, Political Research Institute. And I wrote an essay in there called God and the Dinosaurs. And that was sort of a coming out of the closet for me about my Christian faith. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, my, my, and so I wrote, the editor's great, uh, Warren Alden. He let me write on anything I, I wanted to. I wrote on all sorts of topics, uh, mainly paleontological, but I'm just saying, all right. Uh, at that time, one of the very influential paleontologists was Stephen J. Gould. Stephen J. Gould was an atheist and one of the famous views, uh, clear, and uh, many others were making their views on the subject very clear. Uh, and so I decided, well, you know, I'm going to come out of the closet and I'm going to put her on the line. I said, uh, my, my colleagues in paleontology and evolutionary biology have shared their religious beliefs, uh, which range from none to very little. <laughs> so I, 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 uh, uh, I profess that I am a deeply committed uh, Christian and this is what I believe. And then got you know, a very interesting reaction. It was a, it was a, it was it was a good thing. Somebody, I, I thought I think it uh, it served a very useful purpose that you know letting people know that it was safe uh, to talk about religious faith. And uh, the person that really uh, stimulated my interest in faith and science. I mean, as a cradle Catholic, I never saw a conflict between science and faith, and uh, I never saw any need to integrate. I didn't see any possibility of conflict. But I attended a seminar uh, by Professor Provine from Cornell. Uh, he gave a, uh, a talk called The Evolution of Human Morality. And uh, in it, basically, it was an atheist manifesto. And he said, said, we need to face the implications of evolutionary biology. This is what evolution shows us. There is no God. There is no soul. There is no life after death. There is no such thing as free will. We make hundreds of decisions every day, but they are a result of our either of our genes or of environment. There is nothing else. Uh, as scientists who professes to believe in God is a hypocrite, you must check your brains at the back of the church. I was stunned. I didn't know it. But my my job is sort of <coughs> and, uh, and uh, this was a heavy seminar was a biology seminar and we had the natural sciences and uh, basically I, I felt that everyone in the room was just saying wow wow go 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 get up get up. Uh, I, I, I felt like I belonged in the closet. <laughs> he, 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 he made the statement that not more than a handful of evolutionary biologists believe in God. They could probably be counted on the fingers of one hand. And I didn't, I, I literally had, I was not prepared to address it. So I, I, I left in silence and I sort of got into a funk. And, and then, I, then, then, then I said, no, wait a minute. He didn't ask me if I believe in God. He didn't ask my father if he believed in God. He didn't ask my colleague a uh, doom school. He didn't have to. He had no basis for saying this. Uh, more, not more than a handful of evolutionary biologists 
uh, he, uh, believe in God. He pulled no such study has ever been done. He just pulled that out of thin air. Um, so, uh, so um, he he literally changed. It. So there, there is propositions. Uh, uh, no such thing as free will. Science believes in God is a hypocrite. Yeah. So, uh, so what? So he set me on a course of study <laughs> and investigation and learning and, and, and engaging in this topic. And it made me realize that, that uh, how, how foolish this is. This this was not not this was not science. This is philosophy. How how could you possibly prove these statements? Uh, and these are not scientific statements. Science is very good at what science is good about. Good at it's very good at that. Nothing is better than science. But the thing that there are things that science cannot touch. Uh, if you can weigh it, if you can measure it, if you can time it, if you can drop it on your foot and your foot hurts, that's about science. If I drop this <coughs> on my foot, my foot hurts. That's real. But there are other kinds of reality too. My wife loves me. That's not a, that's not a scientific statement. And we don't do scientific tests to prove that. Um, so there, there are lots of spokesmen for, uh, for atheistic science. Uh, perhaps nobody, nobody more compelling than uh, Bertrand Russell. Whatever knowledge is attainable must be obtained by scientific methods. What science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. That is, a, that is not a scientific statement. That is, a, that is a, based on an a priori philosophy. And I also ask, is this not an impoverished view of reality? Are there are perhaps the most important uh, re realities uh, science can't touch? John Chesterton says, reason itself is a matter of faith. You now, that, that one of the atheistic positions is, I only deal with facts. I don't, no, faith is not about facts. I only deal with facts. Well, you have the reason, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, enshrinement of reason. Well, reason itself is a matter of faith. Of faith. It is an act of faith to assert that our thoughts have any relation to reality at all. And this is something that the, the Darwin realized. The horror of doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed in the mind of lower animals, are of any value or they're all trustworthy. If anybody uh, trusts the convictions of a monkey's mind, if there are any convictions there at all, um, as uh, Chesterton put it, Mr. Darwin can explain everything except Mr. Darwin explaining everything. <laughs> There's a, there's a discontinuity there. And Einstein, science without religion is blind, and religion without science is lame. Thanks, Albert. Uh, one, of the, one of the early heroes that I discovered uh, was uh, Father John Polkinghorne. He was a, uh, a very fine British particle physicist at Cambridge University. Uh, and he walked away from the physics lab at age 43 and took holy orders in the Anglican. Church, and he he founded the Order of Society of Ordained Scientists, and he's written many many books. He's a wonderful writer, uh, and, and a very very orthodox Christian. Um, I'm a big fan of Bookie Barnes. Uh, there, there are a couple of his books uh, published by Princeton University Press and Yale University Press, and one of the really good presses. And he says, we do not live in the lunar landscape of reductionism described by science. So science, uh, uh, the, the scientific worldview is, is a very narrow worldview. And uh, our evolution, one can accept the insights of natural selection, but still feel one has not heard the whole story. That's not, it's very valuable, but it's not the whole story. Uh, the uh, bulking horn goes on. The universe may have been a uh, might have been a disorderly chaos uh, rather than an orderly co uh, cosmos, or it might have had a rationality that was inaccessible <coughs> to us. There is an, there's an influence between our minds and the universe, between the rationality experienced within and the rationality observed without. 
such a reason is provided by the rationality of the creator. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. He wrote a great book called The Great Partnership, Science and Religion and the Search for Meaning. He said, science is like the left side of the brain and religion is the right side. But science takes things apart to see what they work, how they work. Religion puts things together to figure out what they mean. And which is more important, the left side of the heart, the right side of the heart, the left side of the brain, right side of the brain. Believe me, you'd better have them both. Humans are meaning-seeking animals. Science is about explanation, religion is about meaning. You cannot live without meaning. Science and religion are both essential perspectives that uh, keep us human and humane. So science sees us as objects and religion sees it, speaks to us as subjects. The cure for bad science is good science and the cure for bad religion is good religion, not no religion. There is absolutely nothing in science, not in cosmology or evolutionary biology or neuroscience, to suggest that the universe is bereft of meaning. Nor could there be, since the search for meaning has, has nothing to do with science and everything to do with religion. Then uh, Reverend uh, Ken Olson is a retired Lutheran pastor for, from Montana. And what does a retired Lutheran pastor do? Uh, do for fun, he goes out and looks for dinosaur fossils. So he's a wonderful dinosaur collector. He's written this terribly, this lovely extended essay, uh, Lens to the Natural World, Reflections on Dinosaurs, uh, Galaxies, and God. So it's a lovely, it's just a splendid read. Uh, he said, all scientists are part-time scientists, but full-time human beings. It's our, it's our humanity uh, that, that in the end is the most important. Charles Darwin put together his theory of evolution, and uh, of course I'm very cheered by the fact that uh, paleontology is one of his lines of evidence for evolution. But very importantly, uh, evolution does not disprove the existence of God, and it does not necessitate atheism, it, because our, Darwin was never an atheist. Uh, uh, it, it is alleged that Darwinism made it, makes it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. But it, could it actually be that evolution is Darwin's gift to theology? Uh, several people have made that case. Uh, Michael Ruse is a philosopher of science, wrote a book on Darwin, uh, Darwinian being Christian, and he answered, of course you can, absolutely yes. What scientists need to know about religion is that uh, surveys have shown that about 40% of scientists are religious believers. That is, uh, in the questionnaire, um, uh, uh, they express belief in a personal God. Doesn't say they go to church. Doesn't say what they do with this belief. But there is a there is a deep seated belief in in a personal God. So it, it's, it, it's the atheists and the scientists that make in science that make the most noise. But uh, for those who are not religious believers, uh, understand that religious belief is not going to go away. The disappearance of religion has been predicted ever since the Enlightenment, and it has been falsified repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Uh, as uh, Professor E.O. E. Wilson at Harvard says, that religion is the most powerful and complex, complex force in all of human nature, and it is an ineradicable part of what it means to be human. The religious instinct is tremendously strong. Um, there, there are people that try to provide uh, evolutionary explanations of why we're religious, but they're, frankly, they're much simpler uh, explanations. And the idea that, that, uh, that uh, our religion is, uh, is opposed to science is absolute nonsense. Uh, the, the Greek philosophies of, of Plato and Aristotle and pantheism are, are not suitable substrates for evolution to develop. Um, uh, now we see the creation as separate from the creator. That, that is a, a, a legacy in the Judeo-Christianity. Uh, Judeo 
uh, which sees nature as orderly and rational, is a reflection of the mind of God. Very, very important. So uh, science developed in Western Europe uh, because of and not in spite of religious beliefs. So modern science is a fruit of, uh, of, the, of Western Christianity in, in particular. Until the Enlightenment, virtually all scientists were, pers uh, were persons of faith, and doing science was an act of worship. And exploring creation is, is praising the Creator. And uh, as Augustine said, the purpose of the Bible is to show us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. The Bible is not a scientific manual. You don't look well, if you want to know what the weather is going to be tomorrow, don't, you, you don't open the Bible. That's not what the Bible is for. That's misuse of sacred scripture. Um, Thomas Aquinas saw God working through secondary causes that creates a world with his own orienting processes. So uh, God was clever enough to create a, a cosmos which assembled itself. That, that is clever. Uh, uh, assembles itself according to God's laws. Where do the laws of nature come from? You know, you think if you learn science and uh, you think that's 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 the end of the explanation? Well, think a little harder. Where do those laws come from? And so, yeah, some people say, well, religion is irrational. Well, if, uh, rationality is a highly prized uh, feature of religious belief, and as a matter of fact, uh, if you, if, you know, uh, so Fides uh, faith Ratio, uh, faith in reason, uh, or, or, uh, uh, or faith seeking understanding, um, if, you, if you don't have both Fides and Ratio, if you only have Fides, that, that is regarded as a heresy. God has given us our brains, Fideism is a heresy. Uh, God has given us brains and expects us to use them. Uh, well, rationality is highly prized. And who, who, who on this earth, who in history has ever been more rational than Thomas Aquinas? Um, uh, Galileo talked about God's two books, the book of Revelation uh, and the book of nature. And of course, uh, people love to uh, talk about the church being against science because it persecuted Galileo. Well, it's, Galileo struggles, but it's a complicated obviously, you know, he could fill a bookshelf with uh, books on, <laughs> he'd fill a library with books on Galileo. But his struggles were not so much with the, with the church as with the stranglehold of Aristotelianism, which showed the heavens, uh, viewed the heavens as eternal and unchanging. And Galileo certainly, uh, showed that that was not the case. Galileo wrote a wonderful letter to Grand Duchess Christina, which is well worth reading. And he, his position was, the Bible contains such truths as are necessary for salvation. And he left the rest of uh, the rest up for us to find, find out. For, uh, for example, how many planets are uh, mentioned in the Bible? And the answer is one. Venus is the only one uh, mentioned in the Bible, mm. the morning star, uh, which was, I think, referred to Christ. Um, so, uh, no, it just, just, I mean, the, the Bible is wonderful for what it, for what it is intended for, the, the spiritual truths uh, necessary for our salvation. But it's a scientific manual that leaves a lot to be desired. Only 200 species of animals are named in the Bible. Uh, uh, 50 kinds of birds versus nearly 10,000 today. 100 species, 130 species of plants are named in the Bible, which are about 4% of plants in the Holy Land today, you know, only one planet. So um, there's plenty, plenty for us to do. Uh, what the Bible does say, I mean, for example, somebody, uh, if you talk to a fundamentalist, they might talk to, refer to the to the biblical account of creation. Well, there's no such thing as the, the biblical account of creation. Well, I mean Genesis. Well, do you mean Genesis 1 or do you mean Genesis 2? Uh, they're, they're, but uh, plain fact of the matter is 
uh, creation shot throughout the Bible, uh, ever so many places. Uh, Psalm 33, Psalm 104, Psalm 48, uh, Job, uh, and were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Proverbs, Isaiah, uh, uh, John, uh, Colossians. Uh, which kind of creation? Uh, very, uh, the, the common thread, of course, is that God is responsible for all of creation. And of course, that's what we believe. And that, that uh, God, God, is, God created everything. But how do we create? Well, I would say that that is unspecified, and I would certainly say uh, uh, express the evidence, uh, scientific evidence points to the reliability of the evolutionary method, as as uh, as our folks have, uh, have indicated, beginning with uh, Pius the Twelfth. Some of my favorite uh, quotations from the book uh, from the Bible. Um, Psalm uh, 33, verse 4, the works of the Lord are trusted. Well, what does a scientist do to study the works of the Lord? Creation, they, they, uh, the conclusions of the Lord. Uh, and if I study them, I'm not going to be misled because these are trustworthy. God didn't, not, God didn't put fossils in the rocks to deceive me. Uh, in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, we know the Creator through the works of creation. So when again we, we when we study the, the the objects, whether they're um, uh, plants or animals or or, or chemicals or or, or, uh, or heavenly bodies, these are the works of creation, and they tell us something about about God. Um, second letter of Peter: A thousand years is as a day unto the Lord, and as a day is as a, a day is as a thousand years. So. It's not about time. God exists outside of time. Uh, when uh, and so we shouldn't have to think that the seven days of or the six days of creation are six days as we know them today. There are six periods of time, six intervals. But God is outside of time. Uh, the, the same uh, word is found in uh, Psalm ninety. So God is not deceitful. The reason the world looks so old is because it is old. And, and dinosaurs are just as much a part of creation as any other part. Western scientists were not only religious believers, but religiously motivated by those beliefs, beliefs until the middle of the 19th century. And many scientists today are religious believers, including Francis Collins, who has directed the Human Gene, uh, Genome Project and is currently the director of National Institutes of Health. So a scientist of the highest repute. Uh, he's written this lovely book, uh, uh, The Language of God, about his, uh, how his studies of, the, uh, of the, his journey of faith and, and his uh, discovery of his, his uh, interpreting the human genome. Stephen Jay Gould, the, the very uh, famous Harvard paleontologist now deceased, Either half of my colleagues are enormously stupid, or else the science of Darwinism is fully compatible with conventional religious beliefs and equally compatible with atheism. Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, scientific knowledge is a body of statements of varying degrees of certainty. Some of them uh, most unsure, some nearly sure, but none absolutely certain. So where does the overweight confidence of atheism come from? Where, where, where's the evidence? Uh, uh, this, this science, is, science doesn't deal with truths. Does that, does, does, uh, science deals with provisional statements, always subject to revision and in further discoveries. Uh, so there, there was a, a great, uh, uh, great men of science uh, who were, who were uh, Father religious, uh, Father Gregory, Gregory Mendel, the Augustinian monk, who discovered the gene, a uh, very important man. Uh, Father George Lemaitre, a, a brilliant uh, Belgian physicist, and he was the father of the um, Big Bang Theory. Did his PhD at, uh, uh, right, uh, we studied him, I think his PhD was in uh, and he discovered what is now known as Hubble's Law, but should Hubble, the maker, he was the first to derive Hubble's constant 
and the first to propose the expansion of the universe from a, from a tiny primordial, primordial. So, so he's quite literally the father of the Big Bang Theory. So very, very important man. Very humble, very unassuming. Uh, so he got it right. In the beginning, God said, what would be like? And uh, Robert uh, Jastrow wrote a wonderful book uh, called God and the Astronomers. They said, it said, at this moment, it seems as though science will never be able to raise the curtain on the mystery of creation. For the scientists who have lived his faith, uh, by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Jastrow. Uh, one of my uh, particular inspirations in public life is Sarah Chernan, uh, who was a bird of paleontologist of great distinction. He worked in, uh, in China for many years, excavating Peking man. And um, when I when I worked in, in Beijing at the uh, Institute of Bird of Paleontology and Paleoanthropology, you see all the fossils that he has collected and have his, his name on them. Uh, so he was he was a great man. Um, uh, contemporary people. Uh, this is my friend Michelle Francel, who's a chemist at Rainmore uh, College. Uh, she's a member of the Vatican Observatory. Very very devout uh, person. She does prayer every morning at uh, St. Thomas of Villanova with the Augustinians. Um, uh, and she writes a blog called Quantum Theology. But an in 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 interesting read. This is my friend, Sister Kathy Duffy, uh, professor of physics at Chestnut Hill College. Um, she's she's walked the long journey with me in science and faith. And, uh, I met her uh, soon after the Will Provine experience, and we we we've grown up together in the in the in the study of science and faith. And uh, we have the uh, we have the the institute at her uh, college, the Institute for Religion and Science. This is my colleague, uh, Marissa Marsh, who's a cosmologist and a very, very devout uh, woman. Uh, this, uh, this next one is Karen Ober. I found her story very compelling. Uh, tenured professor of astrochemistry at Harvard. Uh, she is a convert from Swedish atheism uh, to Catholicism. Uh, and uh, she has a really, uh, really inspiring story. Uh, Jonathan Looney is likewise a convert uh, from Judaism, uh, and he's a professor, astronomer uh, at uh, uh, Cornell. So uh, Ken Miller, some of you uh, have used uh, high school science books by Ken Miller, uh, biology books. Uh, he's a biochemist at Brown, at Brown University uh, in the Catholic. Uh, and one of, another of my heroes is John Hott, who is a theologian at Georgetown University. He said he tried to be a philosopher, but cheerfulness kept breaking out. <laughs> and uh, he's written a, a number of, number of uh, books, uh, uh, some of provocative, God after Darwin, deeper than Darwin. Uh, and he, he was the one that uh, came up with the concept that evolution was Darwin's gift of theology. Uh, how do, what, what do you possibly mean by that? So what he, what he points out is that uh, creation is unfinished, uh, and, and therefore the, the world is imperfect. And, uh, uh, and uh, this, is, this is very crucial. Uh, uh, and God saw that, that uh, and six, uh, after the six days of creation, God rested. And saw that what he's done, what he had done, was very good. And then this very good is profoundly important, part of the Judeo view, uh, the Judeo Christian view of of creation is that it is indeed very good. We live in a very good world, and not all not, not all religious believers accept this. I mean, some some religions and philosophies think that anything material is evil. And only things spiritual are good, but that that would be that would be a heresy, uh, not a Gnostic heresy. Uh, we we believe that creation is very good, but there is a great difference between very good and perfect. 
How do you improve on perfect? You can't. Perfect is static. Now, per perfection is reserved for heaven, but very good means still room for improvement. We're doing okay. It's, it's the same. It goes. God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you far too much to let you stay that way. So, uh, so God's love for his creation is infinite, in that, by definition, the infinite cannot be poured out in a finite moment, and that God's love for creation lifts creation. We can call that lifting evolution. So God gives inexhaustible depth to creation, both creationism and the scientific uh, philosophy of scientism are the results of superficial readings of nature. Uh, Francisco Ayala, another very distinct, distinguished biology, wrote a book with this title, Ireland's Gift, The Science of Religion. And he said, successful as it is, and as universally uh, encompassing as, as the subject is, a scientific view of the world is hopelessly incomplete. We need something more. And we know where that something more comes from. So science is a tremendously valuable human enterprise, but it is a, li a limited enterprise. It is successful because it is limited. It cannot access all of reality. Science does not provide meaning, does not provide purpose. Science does not tell me how I ought to live my life. Science does not tell me how to uh, tell me to love my neighbor. Uh, so I look for other sources than that. Um, so then what then of dinosaurs? Well, I, I, I say that dinosaurs are one of the jewels of creation. God loved dinosaurs, and like all creation, dinosaurs gave praise to God. Uh, so uh, remember the works of the Lord are trustworthy, and the heavens declare the glory of God. And I thank you. <laughs>